I'm Emily Berg, a board member of the Friends of the Key West Library. Welcome to the final presentation of the Friends of the Key West Library 2021 lecture series. Funds given by the Friends go directly into building the library's collection of books, ebooks, e audio books, and various feature films, documentaries, and series available on Blu ray or DVD. This past year, our Friends group donated $50,000 to the library thanks to your memberships and donations. This lecture series is always free, but we thank you for your donations tonight, which help in defraying the expenses of this program. In this strange year, the expenses have been related to our new uh, friend Zoom account rather than a Key West venue, and donations will also help defray our book sales losses. If you're not yet a member of the Friends, we invite you to join us, and you can do so on our website, friendsofthekeywestlibrary.org. Our speaker this evening is best-selling author Patricia Engel to discuss her latest book, Infinite Country. Her books are available for purchase now through Books and Books at the studios, both online and at the bookstore. A link to purchase books is available on the Friends of the Key West Library website and will appear in the chat during the event. Throughout the event, the chat function is available to send messages to other attendees and panelists. If you have a question for tonight's speakers, you can ask them through the Q&A function. We'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions. I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Mark Powell. Mark is the author of six novels, including Small Treasons and Firebird. He has an MFA from the University of South Carolina and an MA in religion from the Yale Divinity School. He currently directs the creative writing program at Appalachian State University. Please welcome Mark Powell. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and thank you all of you for being here. I'm so excited to get to introduce and talk to Patricia Engel, who is a, an absolutely incredible writer and actually one of those rare people who are actually probably a better human being um, than that's a, a rare thing in writing circles. But let me give you her introduction here officially. Patricia is the author of two previous novels, The Veins of the Ocean, which won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. And It's Not Love, It's Just Paris, which won the International Latino Book Award, and a story collection, Vita, which was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway and the Young Lions Fiction Award, a New York Times Notable Book, and winner of Columbia's National Book Award. She's also received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts. She has published stories everywhere, and not least among them, the best American short stories, the best American mystery stories, the O'Henry Prize stories. Patricia and I met fittingly in Key West maybe a decade ago, Patricia, I think, about 2011, 2012, around then? Um, no, I think it was longer, Mark. It was 2009. Oh, okay, 2009. We were there. <laughs> um, we were there in a workshop together. Uh, mm -hmm. Hilma Wolitzer was doing it, and it was at Judy Bloom's house, which was absolutely fantastic. And I remember you workshopped one of the stories, which later appeared in Vita. I teach Vita almost every semester, so I can practically recite it. And there is no one who has taken a course with me in the last, you know, four or five years that doesn't at least know the opening story, Lucho, inside and out. So it's such a pleasure to talk to you. And as much as I love all your previous books, Infinite Country has gone straight to the top of the list. It's such a gorgeous, moving, powerful book. Then that's, I'm just going to put that out there in general, just so we're clear before we start. Um, Patricia, as I was reading this, you know, I was thinking a lot. The book takes place between the United States and Colombia, but in between it or maybe around it, there's this infinite country of love. And the contrast, it feels almost like a parallel to the way the Andean myths and the creation stories in the books, in the book are juxtaposed to this world, our world, which is of course marked by borders and walls and laws. It's so rigid. Um, the infinite country is sort of what it means to be human. The, the other part feels so inhuman. It feels rigid, it feels cruel. I'm, my first question I'm afraid is that I don't necessarily have a question, but I'm just wondering if you could talk about this. Was this something you had in mind from the start, this kind of contrast? Because it struck me as I was reading it, I was reading something kind of philosophically profound, but it just felt so incredibly natural in the course of the story. Um, thank you so much, Mark. And I'm so honored that you're joining me tonight. Um, not only because we go way back, 
and we met in Key West of all places, but because we met in a workshop, like just talking about our work and helping each other through our work. So, um, and in that time, you had already published books by then um, when we met, but you've published many more books and, and I published mine and it's been so great to, you know, know you all these years and, and talk about our work. So thank you, thank you, thank you for oh, being it's, here tonight. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so, and check out Mark's books because he's a brilliant writer. Well, which um, is probably a better friend <laughs> than book reviewer, but it's appreciated. The, no. So, um, but anyway, uh, Mark, thank you so much for your question. And I've thought about this in different ways as I've been talking about the book and obviously also while I was writing about it. But in, in the most simplest way, uh, you know, Infinite Country is a story about a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation. So it's a family in the process of emigrating, you know, where it's an active process. You know, almost every American family has been through immigration, but sometimes it's so many generations back behind them that uh, there's sort of a disconnection, right? It's not as immediate, but this is a family where it's very close. It's still very much the family story. And in that way, each family really has a story where, where um, the point of origin was compared to where they are now almost becomes like the family myth, the family lore, you know, and certain people in the family usually know those stories better than others and will be kind of the, 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 the story keepers for the family and they'll be the person that people will always ask about, you know, our family history and, and where did we come from and what was life like back in the homeland. Um, and the ancestral stories. So um, Infinite Country is written that way to be a family chronicle of this family in the process of emigrating. But then there is such a deep connection, not just to the country they leave, but to the actual land and the landscape. And that's something that I've gotten more interested in um, over the years, which is really just about not just um, culture and community and those things that we're a part of and that we may leave in this, but the actual land, the actual altitude. Um, a lot of the story is set in Bogota, which is in the Andes Mountains, and you've been there, I, I believe, right? So you know it's very specific. And of course, you live in the Appalachian Mountains, Mark, so you know, you know, these are landscapes that are very particular. And, and in the Andes, on the equator, in that altitude, well, that's, that's something very specific that you kind of have to be there to experience. But that's also something that when you leave with you, after having been there for generations, that I believe we must take with us in some way. You know, how scientists have been um, studying um, over the years how things like trauma are carried in the body and imprint on the DNA and even, you know, show up generations later after it was experienced by some ancestor. So it got me thinking about what are the other things we carry in the body? It can't only be bad things, right? It has to be, you know, the love and the relationships, everything that came before us in our family lines, but also the land where, you know, our ancestors lived and populated and were so, um, connected to the earth, that we must take with us in a way that's much deeper than we're even aware of. This, um, I, I love hearing you talk about this. This is, you've written about this, I mean, this is a theme that runs through all your work, I think, displacement, mm -hmm. physically, culturally, how people fit, how they fail to fit, wherever it may be. But I'm wondering, did you feel like a particular sense of urgency given the last four years? And not just the last four years, but I mean, mm -hmm. we can look at what's happening on the U.S.-Mexico border right now. Mm -hmm. Was there like this need to tell this story immediately? Because this is, I don't know, it feels like it's the apotheosis of all of your previous themes, maybe. It's just, it's kind of built to this. Yeah, um, you are right in that, in that all my books are really telling this story in different ways. You know, the Infinite Country is my fourth book, but all my books have been about immigration, diaspora, and families in transition, geographic transition, the shift that takes place in a, one generation to the next when you leave a homeland for, for a different country, and, um, you know, the different challenges that come with that. So all my books have, have explored that territory, but they were all, um, first person narrators for the most part, right? And they really focused on an individual's experience. In the case of Infinite Country, I wanted to tell a family story. 
a portrait of a family that's all touched by this collective experience. But then also I want to tell it in such a way that gets at the private experience of each member of this family. So they're, they're all experiencing things as a result of the same act of emigrating, but there are things they don't even say to one another. But really, it's an old story. It's not, you know, some people say are tying it to this moment, and that's true, you know, uh, this, it, is, it is current, but it's not new. Uh, it's, it's the story uh, that's uh, very old for people who've um, been experiencing it, they could all tell you that. But also, if you think even more broadly about it, almost every American family has, been, has lived this story. Maybe not in recent memory, but some ways back, they were that family in transition um, as a result of, of moving of diaspora or immigration or voluntary or, or not, but, but of that migratory shift. I'm a little embarrassed to say I hadn't even caught the fact that this is the first book that's not first person because I think I've thought about the <laughs> work a lot. But, you know, I think that's maybe part of – this book is not a terribly long novel. I think my, the copy yeah. I have is, you know, right around 200 pages. But mm -hmm. there's this remarkable sweep to it, right? Mm -hmm. It covers so much space um, both temporally and geographically. So we've got these, and this gives nothing away. We have two mm -hmm. kind of parallel journeys happening or two parallel narrative lines. One is – the daughter, Talia, who is physically mm. moving across Colombia. And I think about mm. you saying you were getting more and more interested in just the, the, the physical landscape. Mm -hmm. And it feels like this was a way to sort of embrace that, right? To kind of explore it. And her journey is just days. It's, it's, it's quite brief, though it's, it's remarkably intense too. And the parallel journey is a family across, you know, decades moving from Texas to the East Coast these, um, there's something in this about um, the intimacy, the particularity of it, the kind of granularity of the mm. experience. And then, as you say, this is a, you know, this is a story we've all experienced at some point in our history and our family. Mm. Did you know this was going to be the shape of the book from the start? Because it's kind of remarkable in that, besides the fact that we see so much and we see with clarity it's kind of like the lives of people who mm -hmm. are often fractured across borders and different timelines and separated from their past, separated from their families. Did you know the book was going to be like this from the start? You should say you did. <laughs> That's such a writer question too, Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it's true. I mean, of course, those as writers, those are the things we wonder about when we read things. Um, I had an idea, but you know, as you know, Mark, in writing your book, that when you start a book, sometimes like you have an idea and a vision and you're like, I don't know how exactly I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have that intention, I should say, from the beginning, but the earlier drafts were much longer. Um, what I knew was that I wanted the book to feel very urgent, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wanted it to feel like a testimony uh, uh, of sorts, like you're sitting down with a person who's telling you this story just in one, you know, full breath, and so that nothing felt extra or meandering or ornamental. I wanted it to feel um, very pared down in that way. So even though my, my earlier drafts were longer, there was a lot of me um, pair, um, you know, chipping away and trying to make it leaner and leaner and leaner. So it felt um, like everything that was there was, was essential and needed to be there. But um, I, I, there were moments where I wanted to um, create those broader strokes the way that, you know, um, myths and legends and those ancestral stories that come up as well, you know, those are, those are stories usually told in broader strokes as well. So I wanted then, you know, the family story to kind of, as it does, as it happens, you know, as a child, your parents' stories are almost become like your myths, right? You right. know, and um, so there are moments that have those broader strokes. And then of course, there's more personal ones, the more interior moments and the quieter moments. Well, I think the word, I wish I had thought of it myself, is, is testimony. It feels just like I'm reading someone mm -hmm. testifying to sort of their, their family's truth. Mm -hmm. um, the book in many ways is, it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's brutal, but brutal things happen to people. Um, 
through the throughout the course of it. And I know these are very, very real things that people experience, but the book is it at least ends full of hope. It's one of the I will give nothing away, but it's one of the more um just hopeful and absolutely gorgeous mm -hmm. endings I've read. Was it important for you that it ended in that fashion? Because you easily mm -hmm. uh, and you would be, you know, justified. It would be realistic to end it in a in a dark fashion. Can you talk about that, the ending? Well, yeah, um, the ending, you know, I I wanted the ending to be true to the circumstances, to the very real circumstances and challenges that this family was enduring. But I knew had I ended it a week earlier, it would have been a very different, you know, story and just as true. At the same time, if I had ended it a week later in their lives, their lives might be completely different. Mm -hmm. Right. So I wanted to end on a moment that was true for this family but and hopeful. But also in that hope, um, there's the understanding that, that this might be very fleeting, that this is a family that's still living in uncertainty and where tomorrow their reality could be entirely different as happened to them before. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's just a moment, uh, uh, you know, you know, as a writer where you just kind of a lot of um, sometimes people think, well, do you know what the end is going to be? Mm -hmm. And sometimes at that point, you're just running on instinct, you know, and when you you arrive at that final note, you know, the emotional note or the tone, and then you think, well, this is where the story will, uh, the pages will end. But of course, you always want to give the feeling that your story will continue the lives of these people, right. you know, can continue. I think there's a term in photography called felt duration, the idea that an image life has preceded it and life carries forward beyond it. And I think you capture that perfectly um, with the ending in particular, but with the entire book. Um, so I'm, this book has been doing really great. Um, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon has it in her book club. I want to know you have, you have been grossly underrated and grossly underread for years. Is it, it's so true. <laughs> and I hope, and I hope those watching, if you haven't read Patricia's other stuff, you'll go out and grab it because it's really remarkable um, from the first page to the last page of Infinite Country. Is it a good feeling? I mean, it's got to be, right? To... Um, is it? Well, you know, it's certainly nothing I ever <laughs> planned on. Um, you know, like you said, I, I wrote three books before this, you know, and, you know, I have some readers, but um, of course, having somebody like Reese Witherspoon, you know, introduce it to her community is, is a whole other thing. Um, but I actually, I admire her very much what she does, you know, to promote books, to promote literacy, to support writers, and especially, you know, she, her, her thing is centering books by women. And, she, and uh, more recently, you know, by people from marginalized communities. So I think that's really cool. And it's been really exciting to, you know, um, to have new readers and people who otherwise would have never thought to read my book, you know. So I think um, that's one of the cool things about technology these days, about especially with the limitations of the pandemic, even what we're doing right now. Well, Mark, you're in, you're in North Carolina and I'm in Miami and here we are doing an event and people can join from all over. So I actually think even though people complain about technology, it's actually doing really good things for books. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so glad it happened in I've been pretty excited about it. It's really, Thank you. It, it makes me feel good to see what's next. So um, I, I was in Miami back in early, just a little over a year ago, early January of 2020. And we were talking about this book. It was um, obviously not out yet. What have you been working? I, I don't want to leave the discussion of Infinite Country here, but I would like to know what you've been working on lately. Mm -hmm. That's funny, Mark, that you mentioned that was a year ago because you were just leaving um, for Europe. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. The pandemic was still a month away. And I think this book hadn't even been sold yet. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot has happened in a year. A lot right? has indeed happened in a year. Uh, yeah. So um, what I've been working on um, is short stories. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Infinite Country, I believe, will be followed by a short story collection in the next year or maybe two and then i'm just sort of in the very early imaginings of a book after that 
Excellent. Well, we won't bother you about that. <laughs> I, I think you should enjoy the success of this book for a while longer. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking here of other things I might want to bring up. One thing I'm curious about is, um, so we're sort of writing in a, a different political climate than we were just, I don't know, what, five or six months ago. I think a lot mm -hmm. of writers, a lot of us were writing in response to the Trump administration, writing in response to a lot of them, just policies in general, um, foreign and domestic. Um, much of that is the same, of course. Some of it has changed, but some of those changes are probably more cosmetic and superficial than otherwise. Does that change? Does the larger political situation, does it influence the way you're working? Or is it just there's a story and you follow that story? Um, you know, it's hard to say because um, in terms of immigration, the administration before Trump was not doing any favors, right. <laughs> you know? So um, um, it, it's, I don't really think, you know, I guess I'm old enough to think, you know, an administration can also feel like a very short period of time. Cause like I said, the, the story of infinite country is an old story and it starts in the late 1990s. So I'm always, of course, looking at our moments, the moments we're in, but it's not enough to just look at the moment. You have to look back. You have to look where, did, where were the earliest traces of, of all these things. Um, so many of the policies that affected immigrants during the Trump administration began before that and before that and before that. You know, One of the reasons why I set Infinite Country over 20 years, particularly starting before the turn of the millennium, is because things shifted so drastically as a result of the events of 9-11 mm -hmm. with regard to how foreigners were perceived in the United States and just the rhetoric that changed so quickly after that. And, and, and uh, the policies and, and uh, it, you know, it was a very dramatic change for those who were on the receiving end. Um, and sometimes I think we lose perspective of how things have been over an even longer period of time. I also wanted to show in Infinite Country how things changed in Colombia during that same time period. You know, um, so I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to say where inspirations really come from, because even though Infinite Country was my fourth book, I feel like it was a book that was a long time coming for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I just maybe needed to age, mature, you know, expand my thinking certain ways before I could really sit down and write it the way that I wanted to or the way that I needed to. Was part of that aging and maturing, I know part of it is just better learning your craft, mm -hmm. but is part of it also digging back through not only Colombian history, but like your family's history? It occurs to me that when we met, Colombia was still a place where you talked about the FARC, um, you know, yeah. all of these things. And it's, it hasn't been that long since Columbia started to show up. It would be like the New York Times best places to go, you know, mm -hmm. tourist destinations and things. Sure. I mean, at least as perceived from the United States, that change seems it's kind of remarkable. Um, at least the perception from the U.S. Did you dig back through family stories? Um, for infinite country, no. Um, I, I don't think I should dig in because uh, when you, I'm, I don't know if this happens to you, Mark. When you're kind of like the family storyteller, people just throw stories at you, and they're like, "You should write about this. You should write about this." <laughs> so um, there are things that I learned through the course of research in infinite country. You know about the land and the stories that are particular to different regions. A lot of things people just kind of handed to me. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you three examples, actually. So, um, for example, the story of Talia, the opening scene, you see 15-year-old um, Talia breaking out of a correctional facility for youth offenders, right? That's a story that I saw mentioned as a headline in a very tiny online publication, news publication, almost 10 years ago when I was working on another book. And it was about a group of adolescent girls who broke out of a juvenile detention center. And so, you know, that was a true to life thing that I just sort of cataloged in my brain for, for future use in the mm -hmm. story, right? But, um, okay, I don't wanna give too much away in saying this, but Talia is in the correctional facility because she um, commits a crime. I didn't wanna ask because I was afraid it would give away. <laughs> I was gonna ask you privately well, in a text about that. Let's say, 
So let's say she commits an act in retaliation for another one, right? For something that she deems an injustice, right? So um, that is a story that uh, was told to me by a girl, not when I was in Bogota, I was in, actually in Bucaramanga for a literary festival. And a girl who was assigned, a college student who was assigned to driving me around, told me that story. Uh, that happened, she, I mean, it, it didn't happen as I wrote it. It was a little bit different what actually happened. But, um, but this, she told me that story. And, and uh, you know, she lived that, that in a different way, but uh, that came from her. There is another story in, this is my third example, in the book about a kind of informal exorcism you know, um, like a, a casting out of bad energies of bad spirits of a household. A, a relative told me that one, you know, and that happened in her home, you know. So, um, so there are things like that, you know, that just sort of like infiltrate from real life. The rest is all imagined. And the way that I put it together is, you know, all imagined. Right. Uh, you know, I have that same thing. My dad will call me and say, I got a story for you. And yes. I just, I, you know, I instantly put it on speakerphone because I know it's going to be a while and I need to just keep going about my business uh -huh. through the course of the day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way, though, you can sort of pull from these different threads and allow something to just kind of percolate or just sit in the back of your mind for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's um, similar to, you know, my book, The Veins of the Ocean, mm -hmm. um, was uh, started out. So The Veins of the Ocean was published as a novel in 2016. And it started out as a short story that I published in 2009. Mm -hmm. And that short story became the first chapter. So that story was called The Bridge, um, began with, I was driving with my mother. Um, and she said, oh, you see that bridge over there? A long time ago, a guy threw a baby off of it. That's all she told me. You know, it's just one of those like, things she just dropped on me and I was like what and, but no information who why where like what happened what happened after nothing I just so all I had was just this image of a baby being dropped off a bridge that was enough for me to pull a short story out of it and then it's that for some reason this never happened with another story of mine but that story sat with me for years you know it continued to percolate beyond a short story's you know, body of limitations, like it wanted to be a novel. And then it became a novel. And it was all from that, just driving in the car, my mom threw that thing at me. <laughs> so I have a story about your story, The Bridge. And that, oh. <laughs> yeah, and that is that the, at the Key West Conference, when, when I met you, I was sitting out, um, it was on Eaton Street on one of the little balconies with some guys. It was kind of late and you and some people were walking up the street and you know, we were calling and saying hello, and I think you were reading it maybe the next day at the conference, uh -huh. and you came up, and I was sitting there with a, a, a couple of other guys, a poet I know well, and he said, oh, we, I've been listening to these readings for the last two hours. I can't hear another word, and you came up, and you said, oh, I'm a little nervous about this. I'm going to read, and I said, read it, and I remember my friend looked at me like, I just said, I've been listening for two hours, <laughs> and you read it, and when you got up, and left, he looked at me and said, okay, you were right. <laughs> like it was so good. He was just sort of Thank stunned you. into silence. The, his impenetrable brain was able to absorb that after so much reading. That's a, it's a remarkable, um, remarkable opening to that book. That's so funny. I remember that night. I remember coming onto the balcony and reading for you guys. <laughs> that was funny. Can we, is it too much of a segue if I ask you about the stories in Vita? Oh, of course. How did those, um, how did you put those together? Because it, this is not giving anything away. It's, I mean, you would, you'd call it a cycle of stories effectively. It kind of moves more or less chronologically. Would you call it a cycle or? You know, I didn't even know that term, like a story cycle until like afterward when someone was talking about my book, I was like, oh, that's, that's a term people use, you know? Um, I didn't think about it in any way, one way or another. I thought, well, I wrote stories and together they form kind of like a novel, but it didn't feel tr like authentic to call it a short story collection. And it wasn't like a traditional novel, so I didn't call it anything. And if you notice on the cover of the book, it doesn't say a novel or stories. It, it just, it, you know, it just is what it is. 
So um, thank you for asking about it, Mark, because nobody asked me about Vietnam anymore. <laughs> and that's like a book that I love so much. It was my first book. And um, the truth is that I wrote it a little bit accidentally because I was working on another novel at the time that was I was having a really hard time with. It was my first, you know, um, big literary endeavor. And um, when I would take breaks from that novel that was just, you know, challenging me so much, I would write stories for fun for myself. And at a certain point, I'd realized I'd written all these stories that were in conversation with one another. And it was like a book. So um, I, I, I got an agent around that time and I sent it to my agent. She was like, oh, yeah, this is a book. But um, yeah, it's not quite chronological. I always, because the um, they follow, uh, Vida is nine short stories that follow a single character over about 30 years of her life. So the first story, she's 14 years old. And in the last story, she's about five or six years old or uh, ish. Um, so the way I conceived of it was that it was ordered uh, like an, an emotional memory, like a map of, of memory, whereas she's telling you the stories as they sort of impacted her, which is why the story that happens earlier, earliest in her life is the last story she tells because she has not been able to understand it until that point in her trajectory. The last story she tells, I recall, is the story I believe you were workshopping yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And I, and I have to make this embarrassing <laughs> confession to you, Patricia. So at the beginning <laughs> of each semester with my fiction students, I will mm -hmm. come in and rather dramatically, I'll always just start reading a story and they'll just sort of, after a couple of minutes, they'll look around weirdly and then they'll settle into it, you know, mm -hmm. and usually it goes really well. Once I decided I was going to read the great James Baldwin, Sonny's Blues, yeah. which I've forgotten takes like 90 minutes to read. Uh, <laughs> But, but so a couple of times I have read Lucho, which I just think mm -hmm. is this fantastic story. And then, of course, they realize I'm this middle aged white guy reading in the voice of Sabina <laughs> between sheer admiration for the story and just sort of wanting to laugh out loud at me, mm -hmm. which I totally get. It's kind of ridiculous and I should probably think it through later. But uh, we we I always read that in every fiction class because it's just such a masterful all of the stories are just so masterfully done the voice carries through it, sabina is so dynamic through the course of the book it's it's a great collection it's so underrated oh thank you so much mark you i are. love that book too <laughs> it's, it takes me back to the the best of florida i think himself yeah um, thank you <laughs> um so I, I'm seeing that there's some chats about questions. I'm not sure if we should segue to that quite yet or if we can talk a little longer. Um, well, whatever, whatever you want. Um, I just saw, let's, uh, let's do one of these questions, Mark, because I think this is a little bit for both of us. Please. About, can you please speak about your workshop with Judy Bloom at her house and how it influenced your writing? So we should say, that we did not take a workshop with Judy Bloom. No, 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 no. It, she just lent her house to, cause, okay. So the workshop was the Key West Literary Seminar and we, Mark and I were in a fiction workshop. Was it fiction or novel writing, Mark? I think uh, it was fiction, right? I, I, I don't recall, but yeah. Yeah. So um, with Hilma Wallitzer. So um, yeah, Judy Bloom let us use uh, like her back. Her remark. Paris area. Yeah, it was beautiful. Area, yeah. But from there, we were able to see her her like writing office, which was very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, we had we had a, a good time in that workshop. And I have to say, one of the, my best memories about the workshop was that I met you, Mark, and also our other friend Chris Arnold, who is another brilliant writer who writes about Brazil, and John Seely. And we met we met Martha Otis. We had a lot of good friends in that workshop that I, we're still I'm still friends with. You yeah, know, no, so it, it, it was uh, it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful festival, and um, you know I loved being a part of it at that time. Yeah, it's uh, I I went back 
one more time or two, maybe two. One time I went back officially and one time I crashed it. And I would love to go back in the future. And of course, Michael Nelson at the, you know, who runs the Key West Library is deeply involved with that. Patricia, somebody's asking if you might read just a little passage. And I think it'd be a great. Yeah, idea. sure. You're the pros. I will read. I'm going to read from, this is the Book of the Month Club edition, which is a little bit larger. So Infinite Country was also selected by the Book of the Month Club. So if you have a subscription, you can order it from there too. So I'll just read from the beginning, the opening scene that I mentioned about Talia breaking out of the, the juvenile facility. It was her idea to tie up the nun. The dormitory lights were cut every night at 10. Locked into their rooms, girls commanded to a cemetery silence before sleep, waking at dawn for morning prayers. The nuns believed silence a weapon, teaching the girls that only with it could they discover the depths of their interior without being servants to the temptations of this world. To be fair, the nuns were not all terrible. Some Talia liked very much. She even admired how they managed to turn the condemned penitentiary population into mostly orderly lamitas. It was a state facility, a prison school for youth offenders, not a convent and no longer a parochial school. The lay staff reminded the sisters to aim for secularity, but on those missioned mountains, the nuns ran things as they pleased. During the day, under the nuns' watch, the girls practiced their downcast gazes. They attended classes, therapy sessions, meditation groups, completed chores, uniformed in gray sweats, hair pulled back, forbidden from gossip and touching, but they did both when out of sight. At night, in the blackness of their dormitory, they gathered to whisper in shards of window pane moonlight. When the nuns patrolled the hall outside their rooms, they became masterful mutes, reading lips, inventing their own sign language, moving quiet as cats, creeping like thieves. They listened for the nuns' footsteps on the level below, sensing vibrations on the wooden floor planks, the search for rule breakers, disruptors their guardians would schedule for punishment at daybreak. The night of the escape, the girls made purposeful noise so the nun on duty would come tell them to be quiet. Sister Susanna was on the night shift. There were many latecomer nuns at the facility left over from some other failed life. The rumor was Sister Susanna was married until her husband divorced her because she couldn't have children. The plan originated with Dahlia, or maybe her father deserved the credit. That afternoon, she was given rare permission to phone him from the administrative office. Family contact was restricted since the staff believed they could be a girl's worst influence. Talia hoped to hear Mauro say he found a way to free her, have her sentence lifted, paid a fine or convinced one of the rich residents of the apartment building where he worked as a janitor to call in a favor on her behalf. One never knows who might be listening, especially in a quasi jail for minors, some of whom were murderers on the verge. Talia and Mauro were careful with their words. He'd tried everything, he said. There was nothing more he could do. She understood liberating herself from the prison and the country would be up to her. With the help of another girl, she spent an hour ripping bed sheets, twisting them tight as wire, thin as rope. She counted to 1,000 in the darkness, then gave the signal for the other girls to start shouting, fire, fire, fire. Sister Susanna appeared in the doorway. Talia waited to catch her from behind with a pillowcase over the head. They had cut breathing holes because they weren't trying to kill anyone, only to paralyze with fright. Talia held the nun while the others tied her to a chair with the shredded sheets, her breath hot on Talia's hands as another girl shoved a sock between her teeth to gag screams. When Talia arrived at the prison school a month earlier, Sister Susanna had called her into her office and told the 15-year-old girl she'd studied her life as if that file of police jottings and psychological assessments on her desk could reveal anything that mattered. You're not like other girls here, she began. Yes, I am, Talia wanted to say. She didn't want to be singled out, treated as an exception if it meant putting the other girls down. I believe it was your desire for justice that led you to do an awful thing, but you badly injured a man. You could have blinded him. A pause, the rattle of voices in the cafeteria down the hall. She knew Sister Susanna was waiting for a response, a denial perhaps, more likely an admission of guilt. The nuns were always scavenging for remorse. Do you want to change? With faith and discipline, anything is possible. 
Talia was not stupid, so she said yes. The girls locked Sister Susanna in their room with the same key she used against them each night. Nobody would look for her or the girls until morning. The sisters and lay staff were in charge of their correction and safety. There were security guards on the property, but they were all men, so the nuns made them stay by the front gates to prevent the girls from developing crushes and the guys from trying to seduce them, as if that were a greater menace than an uprising, the girls taking the building under siege, as happened all the time in men's prisons, the illusion that women are safer among women. The girls returned to their silence, 12 to a room, the building held four dormitories in different corners of the building, each under the patrol of rotating nuns and staff. They knew the other girls. They had classes and meals with them every day. That night, they wouldn't worry about them, though, and Talia no longer worried about the girls with whom she planned her escape. The careless or slow would jeopardize her freedom. They would flee to boyfriends, friends, or relatives willing to hide them, but she had less than one week to get back to Bogota, to the airport, and out of Colombia. When they hurried down the service stairs, out through the back garden to run across the sports field and over the concrete wall spiked with broken glass to the road as plotted, she broke away from the cluster, hustling east past the courtyard, through the gate into the forested hills, spiraling down toward the valley. Halting in a shadow, before her final bolt, she saw the guards in the watch house by the prison driveway, hypnotized by the glare of a small TV. She'd assumed them to be some kind of police. They carried guns and the girls believed they could chase and shoot them in the legs if they were caught trying to escape. She ran alone in the fog through dirt and thicket. It hadn't rained in a few days, so there was little mud. She heard night creatures, frogs, owls, hissing insects. Through the tree canopy, the rustle of rodents or bats. An hour passed, maybe two, lights congealed. An illuminated road laced the forest curtain. She followed until she heard barking dogs warn she'd come too close to the fences of a finca, so she moved down the hill to the street. If you'd passed her in a car as she walked, small in her baggy captivity uniform, an expression more lost than determined, you might not have thought her a fugitive from the school for bad girls up on the mountain, the place said to reform criminals in the making. She came to a gas station far from any route the other girls would have taken approached a grandfatherly man in warden jeans, filling up his truck tank and asked for a ride. Where are you headed? Anywhere but here. She only knew the facility was somewhere in Santander and the nearest town was San Vicente de Chucurí. The man scratched his beard, a word of advice. Don't ever tell a stranger, you'll go anywhere. I need to head south. I hope to make it all the way to Tunja, but I'll take any route to get there. She didn't want the man to know she was headed to the capital in case police asked him questions later. At least from Tunja, she knew she could find her way home. The man said he was going to Aratoca, but would drop her off in Barichara. Lots of tourists and buses passed through, so she could likely find a way south from there. He wasn't leaving until sunrise, though. He needed to sleep a few hours before getting back on the road. She didn't want to return to the woods. Before long, the police would have turned over every vine on the mountain, searching for girls. She told the man she'd wait with him if that was okay. When he finished fueling, he pulled the truck into an unpaved lot behind the station and invited her to follow. She waited as he reached to open the passenger door, then dropped her, his own seat back, leaning into sleep. You can do the same, he said, eyes closed. I won't touch you. I give you my word. I have two daughters not as young as you, but they're still my babies. Her hesitation was mostly for show. Even if he hadn't made such a pledge, she would have done the same, climbing into the truck, nudging her seat as flat as she could, so her head fell below the window line, disappeared. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. That is surely the <laughs> loveliest prison break that's been written. <laughs> <laughs> It's so rich in sensory details, <laughs> yet simultaneously in this book, we get this huge scope of decades and thousands of miles, and you just pack it both into this incredibly compact space. It's like nothing is wasted, you know, every, every detail, there's nothing superfluous, anything. It's just, it's a remarkable book, Patricia, and I'm, I hope you are pleased. So. Thank you so much, Mark. That's a huge compliment coming from you. And um, you know, I'm sure, it, okay, maybe this doesn't happen to you, but even after you write a book and the publisher's like, 
you have to stop changing things now. It's time to, you know, send it off. But then sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, that's not bad what I wrote. Yeah. You know, it's okay. But then every now and then you're like, oh, why, did, why didn't I just oh move, move that word? <laughs> did you move anything just then? Did you edit on the fly? No, no, I didn't. Okay. I don't know. Usually wise. <laughs> well, um, so folks, we're going to segue to our Q&A and I'm going to hand this over to Michael to ask questions. So I wanted to just encourage you to post your questions in the, the Q&A. And here is our fearless leader. Patricia, thank you so much. It's so nice. Thank you, Mark. Good to see you. Thank you so much again. Thank you, uh, both of you, for being here this evening. Um, one of the audience members wanted to know what your writing process was, Patricia. My writing process is, well, I can show you a little bit of it. I love notebooks. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I take a lot of notes and I use um, these things are like my favorite inventions ever. And um, so I spend a long time just sort of um, thinking about a book, um, thinking about the characters, thinking about language, about scenes, about structure. And uh, before I even sit down to write anything. And so I just try to go fill up my notebook pages because then when um, the, the pages start to, you know, take on a density in the notebooks when I'm writing by hand, that's when I feel sort of confident enough to move to the computer and actually start writing the story. But of course, writing is hard. And sometimes you hit roadblocks or you hit walls and you're like, why am I writing this? And does anyone really care? So then I go back to my notebooks and I sort of feel reinvigorated because I remember what all my original ideas and impulses were. So um, my notebooks are, are kind of like me talking to myself at different periods of the process. You know, um, my early enthusiastic self talking to the self that comes up later who's like tired and frustrated and, you know, not sure if she's ever going to finish this book. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. And then, uh, you know, I don't use anything fancy. I use Microsoft Word on the computer and I write in silence and natural light. And that's it. <laughs> and you do that daily or do you have any kind of schedule? Oh. Um, no, daily would be awesome, but that's not realistic. Um, no, when I'm, um, when I'm, uh, already sort of in my mind, um, deep into a project, like I'm, I'm actively writing it, then what I try to do just to make progress is make a schedule, uh, for myself, a, a schedule that's doable. So I'll say, you know, my goal for this week will be X amount of words. And if I can um, break it down into five days, with this many words, then I can meet my goal for the week. And then I'll have a goal for the month. And then I'm able to kind of chart my progress as opposed to just um, getting frustrated by not having the time here or there. So, um, yeah. And I, I'm sure you're really disappointed that you weren't able to tour this book is there talk about touring the paperback or? You know, I have no idea. You probably might know more than I do. I have uh, friends who have books coming out this summer and they're saying the summer is going to be virtual. I've heard, you know, through the fall too. So I don't know. The, a paperback is, you know, still a year away. So uh, hopefully things will be, you know, all open and normal-ish by then. Are you teaching online or do you go in? I have been. I'm on leave this semester, but uh, my uh, my last uh, the fall semester I taught um, I taught on virtually. Um, one of the questions we got from the audience was about uh, whether or not your actual family story was uh, part of this novel. No, this is not my family story. <laughs> my, it's funny because I this is my fourth book, but people always ask if every book that I've written is autobiographical and um, that's great. I wanted to feel like, you know, as true as possible, but, um, but no, my, the, what my parents do have in common with the, with the parents in this um, novel in infinite country is, you know, the homeland, Colombia, my parents are Colombians, but, but um, our family story is quite different. And you've not written about that or 
are the other novels more autobiographical? No, you know, I'm uh, the reason why I love fiction. I became a fiction writer is because I'm I'm not really interested in writing about myself. Um, of course, you know, I'm a person in the world, so I see, you know, everything that I experience is filtered through my eyes and mind and experience. I'm very inspired by my communities, you know, uh, in my immigrant communities and diaspora communities, Latino communities. I'm, I'm that though, to me, they're my heroes. They're my inspirations. So that's very often the landscape and, and the world that I'm writing into, but, um, but you know, the lives are entirely invented and they're, they're not mine nor my family's. Okay. Uh, as a librarian, I have to ask you uh, what you're reading or something mm -hmm. that you've read recently that you really loved. Um, yeah, I can tell you a whole bunch of things. Okay. Um, so some books that I read recently that I loved are The Affairs of the Falcons by Melissa Rivero. Um, that came out last year or so. The Winicana by Angie Cruz, Cantoras by Carolina de Robertis. She's got a new book coming out in the summer called The President and the Fraud that I read an early copy of, and it's really great. And, um, I, I, you know, people should definitely pre-order or put it on hold at the library if it's possible to do that already. Naima Coster's What's Mine and Yours is great. Also, Ordinary Girls, which is a memoir by Jaquila Diaz, and another memoir by another Colombian American writer, um, Daisy Hernandez, is called A Cup of Water Under My Bed. And she's got a book coming out this summer, too, called The Kissing Bug about Chagas disease, which is fascinating and scary. And um, so people can pre order that, put it on hold at the library as well. Very cool. Thank you. Well, I, I, I thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, we're going to bring on Emily Berg to wrap it up. But I, I'm very grateful and very excited for you. The book is doing great. It's a wonderful book. Um, and I hope that you'll come down to Key West again sometime and see us, whether it be at the seminar or just <laughs> coming down to speak at the library. But Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Thank for your you time. so much. I hope so too. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to join you all. It was wonderful. Um, thank you to both of our speakers and Michael, and thanks to everyone for coming. Books are available from both uh, Patricia and uh, Mark at Books and Books. Um, and information on next year's event series will be added as to the website um, as we know more about it. So check out friendsofthekeywestlibrary.org um, and please uh, consider becoming a member of the Friends of the Key West, West Library as well. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>